Good afternoon and welcome to our New Day by Principe. We're happy to share this devotion with you. Um, whether you're watching now or you'll watch us later on, um, we're coming to you from St. Hilda's Church, Fairbank. With me today is David Elcock, one of our choristers, um, um, a retired teacher, and he will be sharing the meditation today. Welcome, David, and thank you. Okay. Um, the devotion is printed here for you and will be shared, so invite you to follow on in with the responses. The call to worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. On those who live in a land of deep shadow, a light has shone. For the yoke that was weighing upon them and the burden upon their shoulders. You were broken in pieces, O God, our Redeemer. Let us pray. 
God of mercy, hear our prayer in this Advent season for ourselves and for our families who live with painful thoughts and memories. We ask for strength for today, courage for tomorrow, and peace for the past. We ask these things in the name of your Christ, who shares our life in joy and sorrow, death and new birth in despair and promise. Amen. And a confession. God, our light and salvation. Forgive us for those moments when we have walked in darkness, stumbling in the wilderness of quarrels, division, and bickering. You have called us to follow you and to fish for people, but too often we think that our way is the only way to do your will. Forgive us, Lord, for the brokenness that we bring upon ourselves. God, the stronghold of our life. Hear our cry as we come to you for unity. Send your spirit to gather us as you desire us. Remind us that unity does not mean uniformity. Teach us that the same mind you call us to have is not ours, but the mind of your son, Jesus Christ, in, whom, in whose name we pray. Amen. So today we have two scripture readings for us. Um, the first one is from Isaiah chapter 9. Um, I will read that one. And the second one is from Luke 22, and David will read that for us. So Isaiah chapter 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Reading from Luke 22, verses 54 to 69. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him in the high priest's house. But Peter was following at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else, on seeing him, said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then about an hour later, still another kept insisting, Surely this man was also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. At that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now the men who were holding Jesus began to mock him and beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who was it that struck you? They kept heaping many other insults on him. When they came, the assembly of the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, gathered together and they brought him to their council. They said, If you are the Messiah, tell us. He replied, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I question you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Okay. All right, in today's... All right. As we can see from the reading... In today's meditation, we have three scenes. 
We read of Peter disowning Jesus soon after his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the secondly, we come to the guards mocking Jesus in the courtyard. And thirdly, we are presented with drama in where, where we see Jesus brought before Pilate and Herod. In these passages, we see how just quick life changing scenes are brought about and their heavy impact on our Christian journey. Reflectively, in the first we capture the weakness of Peter, which in many ways are indicative of our own weakness on Christian in times of real struggle and distress. Here was a man, the rock as he was sometimes referred to within the church, who according to St. John, got so carried away at Jesus' arrest that he drew his sword in order to, to defend his master. Luke alone of the gospel writers recorded the healing that took place thereafter. How courageous and what type of bravery some among us might say. Yet rather than being commended for the act, Peter's reprimanded and urged to put away his sword. This was somewhat of an affront to the fulfillment of Christ's purpose in coming into the world. He came as savior and redeemer as he himself expressed it, his kingdom was not of this world. And the tragic moment was merely in keeping with the fulfillment of the wishes of his father. Knows that as divine healer characterized his ministry, the final act was to restore the ear of the servant of the high priest, which had been cut off in the skirmish. Interestingly, this act of mercy and compassion was done in the presence of both the disciples and his enemies that will later accuse him at the subsequent trials. As hinted, it should be remembered that the ultimate purpose of Christ's coming was to heal and redeem our broken world, as one writer expressed it. He had come to Gethsemane to strengthen his flesh and not his spirit. Note also that even after healing of the high priest's ear, the entire commotion went on as if nothing peculiar had happened. As events further unfolded from Gethsemane, the arresting army proceeded to the house of the high priest with Peter following from afar. In human terms, reason for so doing should provide not difficult for us to understand. Perhaps he did so to avoid separation from his master, or no less importantly, to avoid detection in order to save his own life. Unfortunately, in tragic moments, we generally feel alone regardless of how much surrounded we are. Anyway, then, this was Peter's dilemma. Such dilemmas also symbolic for our own time as well. Like Peter, many of us as Christians follow Christ from afar. In so doing, far too often, many feign love for him, but there are still others that remain reluctant to get in close enough out of fear for others realizing that they too adhere to the belief as well. In effect, in his moment of weakness, Peter was unafraid to get too close. Peter was afraid to get too close out of fear that they might crucify him as well. In other words, if we all get too close to Jesus, our friends and neighbors might possibly turn on us and per persecute us for that or whatever other reason. With the risk of detection hanging over his head, Peter tried hard to avoid and escape detection. And when detection and identification got too close for comfort, a quick recourse was to disavow any knowledge and or association with the accused. Eventually, identification and confirmed identity brought out the ultimate and most adamant denial, coupled with the crowing of the cock quickly thereafter. Dramatically, Peter fully realized what he had done and clearly remembered Christ's words. Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. In this moment of weakness and under the pressure of death, Peter did the very same thing that he had said he would never do. And herein, we can ever so often see ourselves and also ponder Christ's own words from the cross. Father, forgive. They know not what they do. Following denial and rejection, Luke tells us that Peter went out and wept bitterly. 
much ashamed of himself and his actions, he probably felt that the Lord would never again have any further use for him for further work in the ministry. And hating his own weakness, we read that he went back to his nets to fish for a living again. In verse 63 to 65, we are presented with further details of the trial that followed. Here we see Christ as victim, as the sacrificial lamb, being wounded for our transgression and bruised for our iniquities. What heavy price to pay for our redemption. Death on the cross did not mean a crash of the promised hope and deliverance. We would come through the resurrection, resurrected Messiah, and what, and what better time than reflecting on the season of Advent itself. In Handel's great oratory of the Messiah, the beauty and meaning of Christ finds great expression. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Yet he triumphantly rose from the dead to reign supreme as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What hope is availed to us? His authority and power transcends our human weaknesses. He has redeemed us, and at what price? From humble birth at Bethlehem, his death on Calvary is the price of our redemption and serves to empower, empower for continuation of the mission for which we are called. As Isaiah so well expressed it in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 9, for unto us a son is given, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, shall, there shall be no end. In closing, as we reflect on today's readings, find strength in Christ, who is the author and finisher of our faith. Like Peter, there are times when we too find ourselves challenged beyond measure. But with Christ as an example, our hope find revision as our fears are banished. Amen. Amen. And now invite us to, to pray. Let us pray. Wonderful counselor, grant wisdom to political leaders to govern with kindness and care, to campaigners to creatively challenge injustice and inequality, and to peacemakers to find lasting solutions to protracted conflict. May the light of your wisdom dawn in the darkness of selfish ambition. Mighty God, grant courage to those having to escape their homes to find refuge to those dreading the next violent outburst, and to those unsure of the future for their families. May the light of your courage dawn in the darkness of fear. Everlasting Father, grant us inspiration to imagine a world free from species extinction and climate chaos, to make economic decisions so all the earth may flourish to commune with creation as creature before consumer. May the light of your inspiration dawn in the darkness of despair. Prince of Peace, grant the peace that silences gunfire and bombs, that stills us to recognize com complicit choices, that recognizes war-weary enemies. May the light of your peace dawn in the darkness of conflict. We pray for all who are given authority within the church as bishops, priests, deacons, and the lay people. Today we pray for Samuel Rose to be consecrated as bishop of the Diocese of Eastern Newfoundland and Labrador. We pray for the diocese as well. May your presence be felt in that part of your vineyard. We pray all this in the authority of the child that has been born for us, the son given to us this day. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior has taught us, we're bold to say together, our Father, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And an, an Advent blessing. O oh God, when the world grows dark and the advance of evil appears unstoppable, may we never lose our vision of Emmanuel's light. When society seems uncaring and indifference predominates, may we never forget the warmth of Emmanuel's love. When people cry out for justice, but self-interest prevails, may we never lose the fire of Emmanuel's anger. When we know we must speak out, but our tongue seems to shrivel, may we draw boldness from the truth of Emmanuel's proclamations. When those we must confront are powerful and our hearts grow fearful. May we take strength from the courage of Emmanuel's actions. O oh God, when the moment comes and we must make our stand. May it always be at Emmanuel's side. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. some announcements that are we continue with our noonday bite and sip each week on tuesdays and thursdays so looking forward to see you on thursday next um our sunday service is for sunday coming is the december 20th and that service will be pre-recorded and premiered at 10 30 a.m it is a service of advent service advent christmas carols and lessons it will be pre-recorded on Saturday and premiered on Sunday. Also remember our online Sunday school program, Kids for Jesus, that comes on every Sunday at 12 noon. It's on, the, on YouTube, on our Facebook page, and also on our website. Um, thanks to Martin De Groot for the music we use today and all the liturgical resources that were cited that were used above. And thanks to David for that meditation today. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. I pray that you will be blessed and be a blessing. And in the meantime, be safe. Same to you. Yeah.